Hello class and welcome to the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, Chapter 16, Cardiovascular Emergency Lecture. After you complete this lesson and related coursework, you will understand the significance and characteristics of the anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system, cardiovascular emergencies, the pathophysiology of respiration and perfusion, signs and symptoms of the most common cardiac conditions, the indications, contraindications, and the use of uh, automatic external defibrillators, and the general care of a patient experiencing a cardiac emergency. Okay, cardiovascular disease accounts for about one of every three deaths. EMS can help reduce deaths by provi providing the following services. So we can encourage people to follow a healthy lifestyle, um, early access to medical care, and uh, have more CPR training of lay people, and increase uh, use of evolving technology in dispatch and cardiac arrest response. Public access to defibrillation devices, recognition of the need of ALS, advanced life support, and the use of cardiac specialty centers when they are available. All right, so the anatomy and physiology of uh, the cardiovascular system. So the heart's job is to pump blood to supply oxygen and rich red blood cells to tissues of the body. The heart is divided down the middle into the left and right sides, each with an upper chamber, which is the atrium, it to receiving incoming blood and the lower chamber, which is the ventricle, to pumping outgoing blood. This figure on the slide illustrates the heart. Blood leaves each of the four chambers of the heart through one-way valves, which keep the blood moving through the circulatory system in the proper direction. The aorta is the body's main artery. It receives blood ejected from the left ventricle and delivers it to all other arteries that supply the body's tissues. This figure on the slide illustrates how blood circulates through the heart. The right side of the heart receives oxygen poor blood from the venous circulation. The left side of the heart receives oxygen rich blood from the lungs through the pulmonary veins. Okay, so the heart's electrical system controls the heart rate and coordinates the work of the atria and the ventricles. The heart generates its own electrical impulse and it starts with the sinus node. The impulse passes from the at atria to the ventricles. Automaticity allows spontaneous contraction without a stimulus from a nerve source. As long as impulses come from the SA node, the sinoatrial node, the other myocardial cells will contract when the impulse reaches them. If no impulse arrives, however, the other myocardial cells are capable of creating their own impulses and stimulating a contraction. Okay, this uh, the figure on this slide illustrates the electrical conduction system of the heart and it's showing the SA node, how the electrical impulse goes down to the AV node, then into the bundle of Hiss, down into the um, per Purkinje fibers. Okay, the autonomic nervous system, it's ANS, controls involuntary activities of the body. The ANS has two parts, which normally balance one another. That's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight system. This speeds up the heart, increases respiratory rate and depth, dilates blood vessels in the muscle, and constricts blood vessels in the digestive system. In times of stress, this system takes control. Next we're going to talk about is the parasympathetic system. This system slows heart and respiratory rates. It constricts blood vessels in the muscles and dilates blood vessels in the digestive system. In times of relaxation, this system takes control. 
the myocardium must have a continuous supply of oxygen and nutrients to plump, pump blood. Increased oxygen demand during periods of physical exertion is supplied by dilating or widening of the coronary arteries. Stroke volume decreases the volume of blood ejected with each ventricular contraction. Increased stroke volume results in increased cardiac output. Okay, the coronary arteries are blood vessels that supply the blood to the heart muscle. They start at the upper part of the aorta, just above the aortic valve. The right coronary artery supplies blood to the right atrium and to the right ventricle, and in most people, the inferior wall of the left ventricle. The left coronary artery supplies blood to the left atrium and the left ventricle and divides into two major branches just a short distance from the aorta. This figure on the slide illustrates how the coronary arteries carry the blood supply to the heart. The arteries supply oxygenated blood to different parts of the body. So the right and left car carotid arteries supply um, the head and brain. The right and left subclavian arteries supply the upper extremities. The brachial artery supplies the arms. The radial and ulnar arteries supply the arms, the lower arms and legs, or lower arms and hands. And the right and left iliac arteries supply the groin, pelvis, and legs. The right and left femoral artery supply, um, uh, supply the legs, and the anterior posterior tibia arteries supply the lower legs and feet. The arterioles and capillaries are smaller vessels that receive blood from the arteries. Capillaries are one cell thick. They exchange nutrients and oxygen for waste at the cellular level, and they connect to art arterioles to venules. The venules and veins receive blood from the capillaries. Venules are the smallest branch of the veins. The vena cava returns oxygen-poor blood to the heart. The superior, which is the upper vena cava, carries blood to the head and the arms back to the right atrium. And the inferior, which is the lower vena cava, carries blood from the abdomen, kidneys, and legs back to the right atrium. Blood consists of several types of cells and fluid. We're going to talk about four main um, um, parts of the blood. And the first part is the red blood cells. They carry oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. Then you have the white blood cells. They fight infection, then the platelets, they help blood clot, and then plasma is the fluid that the cells float in. Okay, we're going to talk about blood pressure next, and that's the force of circulating blood against artery walls. So the systolic blood pressure is the maximum pressure generated in the arms and legs during the contraction of the left ventricle during that time period known as systole. The top number of the blood pressure reading is systole. Now, diastolic blood pressure is the pressure against the artery walls when the left ventricle relaxes. The bottom number in the blood pressure reading is the diastole or di diastolic. And the pulse is felt when blood passes through an artery during systole. The peripheral pulses are felt in the extremities so um, the radial or posterior, and the central pulses are felt near the trunk. Think of the femoral arteries or the carotid arteries. In this figure, on the slide, demonstrate common pulse points. So in A, you'll see the carotid pulse. B is the femoral. You'll see the brachial pulse, the radial pulse, the posterior tibial pulse, and the dorsalis pedis. Okay, cardiac output is defined as the volume of blood that passes through the heart in one minute. It's calculated by multiplying the heart rate 
by the volume of blood ejected with each contraction. So the um, volume of blood ejected with each contraction contraction is called the stroke volume. And so in the field, stroke volume can be roughly determined by the heart rate and a and the strength of the patient's pulse. So perfusion describes a constant flow of oxygenated blood to the tissues. Good perfusion requires the following. So it requires a well-functioning heart. Uh, it's a, a meaning the appropriate heart rate allows the proper volume of blood to be circulated. Good perfusion requires an adequate volume of blood, uh, reduced volume through, let's say, a hemorrhage or limits the amount of tissues that can be perfused. And good perfusion requires blood vessels that must be appropriately constricted to match the volume of blood available. So uh, dilated blood vessels mean a reduced perfusion. If perfusion fails, cellular death occurs and eventually the patients will die. So the pathophysiology. So heart-related chest pain usually stems from ischemia, and um, that which is a decreased blood flow to the heart or inefficient supply of oxygen and nutrients. So ischemic heart disease involves a decrease in blood flow to one or more of the portions of the heart muscle. If the blood flow is not restored, the tissue dies. Atherosclerosis is a disorder is a disorder in which calcium and cholesterol build up and form plaque inside the walls of the blood vessels. It can cause complete occlusion or blockage of that coronary artery and the and other arteries of the body. Fatty material accumulates as the person ages, resulting in a narrowing of the luminum, which is the inside diameter of the artery. The inner wall of the artery becomes rough and brittle. If the brittle plaque develops a crack for an unknown reason, the ragged edge of the crack activates the blood clotting system. This results in a blood clot that will partially or completely block the luminum of the artery. A thromboembolism is a blood clot that floats through the blood vessels. If it reaches an area too narrow for it to pass, it blocks. It will stop and block the blood flow at this point. Tissue downstream from the blood clot will suffer hypoxia. If too much time has passed before the blood flow is resumed, the tissue will die. This sequence of events is known as an acute myocardial infarction. Um, which is also known as an AMI, and that is a classic heart attack. Infarct means death of tissue. The death of tissue, of death of heart muscle, can severely diminish the heart's ability to pump, called cardiac arrest. In the United States, coronary artery disease is the number one cause of death for men and women. The peak incident of heart disease is between the ages of 45 and 64 years old, but it can strike in individuals ranging from their teens to their 90s. Risk factors place a person at higher risk for an AMI, acute myocardial infarction, and the major, um, major controllable risk factors. So there's two. You could have risk factors which are controllable, and you have uncontrollable risk factors. So risk factors that are controllable are such as cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, elevated blood pressure or blood glucose levels, um, and lack of exercise and obesity. Uncontrollable risk factors include uh, age, family history, uh, race, uh, ethnicity, and um, being male. Acute coronary syndrome, or ACS, describes a group of symptoms related to myocardial ischemia. This includes temporary myocardial ischemia resulting in angina pectoris, or a more serious condition, and AMI. 
Angina pectoris occurs when the heart's need for oxygen exceeds the available supply, usually during physical or emotional stress. It can result from a spasm of the artery, but is most often a symptom of atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. When um, it may be triggered by a large meal or sudden fear, or when increased oxygen demand goes away, the pain usually goes away. So angina pain or chest pain is commonly described as crushing, squeezing, or like somebody is standing on their chest. Um, it can radiate into the jaw, arms, frequently into the left arm, mid back or epigastrin, the upper middle region of the abdomen. It usually lasts from three to eight minutes, but rarely longer than 15 minutes, and may be associated with shortness of breath, nausea, and sweating. It usually disappears prompt with rest, supplemental oxygen, or nitro. Um, although angina does not usually lead to death or permanent heart damage, it is an early warning sign that should be taken seriously. Okay, so there is unstable angina and then stable angina. So unstable angina occurs in response to fewer stimuli than normally required to produce angina. So stable angina responds to rest and nitro. So see skill drill 16-1 in your book. Patients experiencing chest pain or discomfort should always be treated as if they're having an acute myocardial infarction. The pain of an acute myocardial infarction signs an actual death of cells in the area of the heart where blood flow is obstructed. So once dead, the cells cannot be revived. They turn to scar tissue and become a burden to the beating heart. About 30 minutes after blood flow is cut off, some heart muscle begins to die. And after about two hours, you, um, as many as half of the cells in the area may be dead. After four to six hours, more than 90% of the cells will be dead. So opening the coronary artery with either clot busting, which is also known as a thrombolytic drug, or angioplasty, which is the mechanical clearing of that artery, can prevent permanent damage if it is not done within the first few hours after the onset of symptoms. Immediate transport is essential. So the signs and symptoms of acute myocardial infarction include the following. So the patients may have a sudden onset of weakness, nausea, and sweating, um, chest pain, discomfort, or pressure that often causes a squeezing that does not change with each breath. So pain, discomfort, or pressure in the lower jaw, arms, back, abdomen, or neck, irregular heartbeat, um, maybe even syncope, which is fainting, or shortness of breath, which is dyspnea, and nausea, vomiting, pink, frothy sputin, and often sudden death. The pain of an AMI differs from the pain of angina in three ways. Okay, it may or may not be caused by exertion and can occur at any time, sometimes when the person is sitting quietly or even sleeping. It does not resolve in a few minutes. Rather, it can last for 30, 30 minutes or several hours, and it may or may not be relieved with rest or nitro. So not all patients who are having an AMI experience pain or recognize when it occurs. So when called to the scene where the chief complaint is chest pain, complete a thorough assessment no matter what the patient says. The physical findings of an AMI and cardiac compromise include the following. So the general appearance. So they will appear frightened, nausea, vomiting, or cold sweat. Uh, they could be pale or ashen gray skin or cyanotic. Their pulse rate increases in response to the pain, stress, fear, or injury of the myocardium. So irregularity or a slowing pulse rate, you might actually see bradycardia due to damage of the inferior area of the heart. Blood pressure, so the blood pressure may fa fall due to the diminished cardiac output and left ventricle function. Most AMI patients will have a normal or possibly elevated blood pressure. Respirations will usually be normal. If the patient has congestive heart failure, uh, or CHF, they may be rapid. Um, the respi 
rations may be rapid and labored with a higher likelihood of cyanosis, cyanosis and possibly frothy sputum. Mental status, they may have confusion or agitation or overwhelming feeling of impending doom and uh, may actually say, I think I'm going to die. So an AMI can have three serious consequences. So sudden death or cardiogenic shock or congestive heart failure. Okay, so dysrhythmia, that describes an abnormality of the heart rhythm. And so PVCs or premature ventricular contractions are extra beats in a damaged ventricle. So that when the lower um, chambers of the heart become damaged, they're harmless and common among healthy as well as sick people. So tachycardia describes a rapid beating of the heart. So at 100 beats or more, we describe this as tachycardia. Bradycardia describes unusually slow beating of the heart, and it's at 60 beats or less, we consider it bradycardia. Ventricular tachycardia describes a very rapid heart rate at uh, 150 to 200 beats per minute and may deteriorate into a rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation describes a disorganized, infecti ineffective quivering ventricle. And basically no blood is pumped through the body and the patient usually becomes unconscious within seconds. Defibrillation may occur, um, may convert this arrhythmia. So a good way to remember it is ventricular fibrillation needs to be defibrillated. Defibrillation is a process of shocking the heart with the specialized electronic equipment to restore the normal cardiac rhythm. It can save lives in sh if shocks are delivered within the first few minutes of sudden death. CPR must be initiated until the defibrillator uh, is available. Chances of survival diminish approximately 10% each minute until defibrillation is accomplished. A systole is the absence of all electrical activity. It usually reflects a long period of ischemia. So nearly all patients with a systole will die. So cardiogenic shock is a type of shock which occurs when the body tissues do not get enough oxygen um, causing body organs to malfunction. And so it is caused by a heart attack. The heart lacks the power to force enough blood through the cardiovascular system, and it is more common in AMI affecting the inferior and posterior regions of the left ventricle. It's important to recognize um, shock in its early stages. Next, we're going to talk about congestive heart failure. So congestive heart failure, which is known as CHF, often occurs within the first few days after a myocardial infarction. So CHF develops when increased heart rate and enlargement of the left ventricle no longer make up for the decreased heart function. And so it is called congestive because the lungs become congested with fluid. Now, um, fluid in the lungs is known as pulmonary edema, and once the heart pump fails to pump effectively, so it can occur slowly or slowly over months. In onset of CHF, several pulmonary edema or severe pulmonary edema is accompanied by pink frothy sputum and severe dyspnea. Fluid may also collect in other parts of the body, um, the lower extremities, uh, the feet and the legs. We call this dependent lividity. Hypertensive emergencies involve any systolic blood pressure greater than 180 millimeters of mercury or a rapid increase in the systolic pressure. Its sudden severe headache is a common sign. The other symptoms include uh, the following, so strong bounty pulse or often ringing in the ears. Nausea and vomiting, dizziness, warm skin, nosebleeds, or altered mental status, and a sudden development of pulmonary edema. 
So if left untreated, hypertensive emergencies can lead to stroke or dissecting aortic aneurysm, treatment pa transport patients to the hospital as quickly and safely as possible, and consider advanced life support assistance depending on the transport distance and time. Okay, an aortic aneurysm describes a weakening in the wall of the aorta. It is suspected um, it could rupture. If it ruptures, blood loss will cause the patient to die almost immediately. And a dissecting aneurysm occurs when the inner layers of the aorta become separated and it allows blood flow to um, at high pressure between those two layers. Uncontrolled high blood pressure is usually the cause. This table on the slide lists the different pain presentations between the um, acute myocardial infarction and the aortic aneurysms. And so take a look at this table. Um, and compare the difference. So with when you have a, an AMI or acute myocardial infarction, when you have the onset of pain, it could be gradual with additional symptoms. But a dissecting aneurysm, so when that aorta in is uh, when there's an aneurysm present, it is an abrupt and um, abrupt pain without additional symptoms. The quality of pain for acute uh, myocardial infarction includes tightness in the tightness or pressure, whereas that dissecting aneurysm is sharp or tearing. Um, the severity of pain for a heart attack increases slowly with time, and then the dissecting aneurysm is at maximum from onset. And so the timing of the pain, it can wax and wane for a heart attack. But uh, when you have a dissecting aneurysm, it does not abate once it's started. So, um, so just uh, uh, compare and look at the difference between the, the two symptoms. Okay, the signs and symptoms, um, once again, for an aortic aneurysm is a very sudden chest pain. It's located in the anterior part of the chest or behind or in the back between the shoulder blades. The pain is usually comes from a full force from um, one minute to the next. So sometimes a difference in blood pressure between the arms or diminished pulses in the lower extremities um, will be a, uh, a sign. And transport patients to the hospital as quickly and safely as possible. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the patient assessment um, with uh, cardiovascular emergencies. So when you um, uh, the scene size up, of course, we have to ensure that the scene is safe. Ensure the scene is safe for uh, you, your partner, and your patient and bystanders, of course. Determine the necessary standard precautions and which you need additional resources. So determine the nature of illness, the NOI. Use information from the dispatcher, clues at scene, and the comments of family members and bystanders. So form a general impression. If the patient is unresponsive and not breathing, of course, begin CPR, starting with chest compressions and call for an AED. Assess the patient's airway and breathing. If dizziness or fainting has occurred due to cardiac compromise, consider the possibility of a spinal injury from the fall. Assess breathing to determine whether the ailing heart is receiving adequate oxygen. So shortness of breath with no signs of respiratory distress. If the oxygen saturation is less than 95%, administer oxygen at four liters nasal cannula. If you do not improve, if it if they do not improve quickly, apply oxygen with a non-rebreather mask at 15 liters. Note, no, not breathing or inadequate breathing, apply 100% with a BVM. And then pulmonary edema. So positive pressure ventilation with a BVM or continuous positive airway pressure known as CPAP. So assess the patient's circulation, the pulse rate and radiation, skin color, moisture and temperature, cap refill and time. Consider treatment for cardiogenic shock early to reduce the work of the heart. So position the patient in the comfort position usually sitting up and well supported. So make a transport decision based on whether you are able to stabilize life threats during the primary assessment. 
The remainder of the assessment can be performed en route if time allows. Most patients with chest pain should be transported immediately. Follow local protocols for determining which receiving facilities is most appropriate, so the nearest facility or a medical center with, a, with special capabilities. Um, determine whether to use lights or siren for the patient, so partially partially based on the estimated transport time. As a general rule, patients with cardiac problems should be transported in the most gentle, stress-relieving manner possible. History taking. So investigate that chief complaint. Because patients experience AMI or an acute myocardial infarction will have different signs and symptoms. Seriously consider all complaints of chest pain and discomfort, shortness of breath, and dizziness. If the patient is experiencing dyspnea, is it due to exertion or related to the patient's position? Is it continuous or does it change? If the patient has a cough, does he produce sputum? Does the patient have nausea, vomiting, fatigue, headache, or palpations? Ask about recent past trauma. Obtain a sample history from a responsive patient. Ask the following questions. Have you ever had a heart attack? Have you been told that you have any uh, heart problems? Do you have a risk for uh, factors of coronary artery disease? In addition, ask what allergies do you have? Is the patient taking medications? If so, what is it prescribed for? Is, it, is there over-the-counter medications or home rem remedies? And include the OPQRST questions when obtaining the symptoms as part of the sample history. So using OPQRST helps you understand the details of specific complaints. And uh, this, the table on the slide displays the OPQRST mnemonic for assessing pain. Okay, and then there's the secondary assessment. After you do the uh, history taking, which is the sample history and the OPQRST, we're going to move on to the secondary assessment. And what we want to focus on is the cardiac and respiratory systems. And so we're going to um, focus on the circulation. So assess pulses at various locations, skin color, skin temp, skin condition, respirations. Our lung sounds clear. Our breath sounds equal. Our neck veins distended. Is the trachea deviated or midline? Measure and record the patient's vital signs. So the pulse respirations, um, the systolic and diastolic pressures in both arms. If available, use the pulse ox. If continuous blood, way, uh, blood pressure monitoring is available, use it well. Repeat at appropriate intervals and note the time that each set of vital signs is taken and recorded. In patients with chest pain, it is very valuable valuable to have a 12 lead ECG tracing from the earliest possible after the onset of chest pain. So EMTs may assist with the placement of electrodes. Okay, and then we're going to do reassessment. So we're repeating the primary assessment by checking to see whether the patient's chief complaint or condition have improved or are deteriorating. We're going to reassess the vital signs every five minutes or any time sufficient changes in the patient's condition occurs. So sudden cardiac arrest is always a risk with patients experiencing cardiovascular emergency. If cardiac arrest occurs, if an AED is immediately available, use it. If not, perform CPR until the AED is available. We're gonna reassess our interventions, provide transport if not performed already, and then we're going to communicate and document. So alert the emergency department about the patient's condition and estimated time of arrival, and follow the instructions of medical control. Document your assessment and treatment of the patient. We're going to ensure a proper position of comfort. We're going to allow patients to sit up if uh, it's most comfortable and loose and tight clothing. We're going to give oxygen if indicated. So continuously reassess oxygen saturation and the patient's respiratory status. So use a nasal cannula for patients with mild dyspnea. Use non-rebreathing face mask uh, for patients with a more serious respiratory difficulty. So titrate the oxygen to obtain an oxygen saturation between 95 to 99%. Assist unconscious patients with breathing as well as those with obvious respiratory distress. So we're going to use a BVM or positive pressure ventilation device according to local protocols. Depending on local protocols, prepare to administer low dose aspirin and assist with prescribed nitroglycerin.
Next, we're going to talk about aspirin. Okay, so what aspirin does, it, it prevents blood clots from forming or getting bigger. And so 81 milligram chewable tablets and um, is is how it's dosed. And uh, it's a recommended dose um, to give them between 162 milligrams, which is two tablets, to 324 milligrams, which is four tablets. So from two to four tablets uh, is the recommended dose. And next there is nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin uh, is the medicine that we use and it's available um, in a sublingual pill or sublingual spray. So under the tongue, on, um, a skin patch is also can also be applied to the chest. So what nitroglycerin does, it uh, the mechanism of action is it relaxes the blood vessel walls um, it increases blood flow and oxygen supply of the heart, and so it decreases the workload of the heart, and it dilates the blood vessels. It also can cause uh, severe headaches, so it may cause change in a patient's pulse rate um, as well, so it may um, make them tachycardia or bradycardia. Okay, so when it comes to nitro, because it is a vasodilator, it dilates those vessels and allows blood to get past that blood clot. It, um, we also have to um, make sure that some um, things are, um, are done prior to us administering the nitro. So we have to take blood pressures and we have to make sure that the patient's blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure is greater than 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, if, if the systolic blood pressure is less than 100, we do not administer um, nitro. We also cannot administer nitro if there is a presence of a head injury. Uh, we also cannot uh, not administer nitro if there's a use of an erectile dysfunction drug within 48, 24 to 48 hours. And then the maximum prescribed dose um, has already been given. Uh, we cannot give the nitro. So um, usually three doses. If that's already been given, we, we cannot give um, any more. Okay, so when we administer nitro, we have to make sure these medications are, are neither expired nor contaminated before we administer them. So we have to look at the expiration date. Um, we have to make sure the prescribed medications are prescribed for the patient. We need to wear gloves and um, we have to f we'll follow the steps in skill drill 16-1 in our book. Okay, so cardiac monitoring. For an ECG to be reliable and useful, the electrodes must be placed in consistent positions on the patient. And certain basic principles should be followed to achieve the best skin contact and minimize artifact in the signal. And so artifact refers to an ECG trace tracing that is a result of interference and uh, such a patient movement rather than the heart's electrical activity uh, is referred to as as artifact. The guiding principles of cardiac monitoring. So it may be occasionally, it may occasionally be necessary to shave body hair um, from the electrode site. So rub the electrode site briskly with an alcohol swab before application to remove oils and dead tissues from the skin surface and attach the electrodes to the ECG cables before placement. Confirm the appropriate electrode may uh, now attached to the cable is placed in the correct location on the patient's chest or limbs. Okay, on this figure, um, this figure on the slide illustrates the correct placement of the ECG electrodes. Once all the electrodes are in place, switch on the monitor, print a rhythm strip, and if the strip shows any artifact, um, verify that the electrodes are firmly applied to the skin and the cable monitor is plugged in correctly. So follow the steps in Skilder 16-2. 
Okay, next we're going to talk about heart surgeries and cardiac assistive devices. So over the past 30 years, hundreds of thousands of open heart operations have been performed to bypass damaged segments of car coronary arteries in the heart. In a coronary artery bypass graph, a blood vessel from the chest or leg is sewn directly from the aorta to the coronary artery beyond the point of obstruction. So percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty involves the following steps. So a tiny balloon is attached to the end of a long thin tube. The tube is threaded into the narrowed coronary artery and inflated. The balloon is then deflated and the tube and balloon are removed. Sometimes a stent is placed inside the artery to hold the, that um, narrowing section open. Patients who have had bypass procedure may or may not have a long scar on their chest. So treat chest pain in patients who have had any of these procedures in the same way that you would treat chest pain in patients who have not had heart surgery. Some people have cardiac pacemakers. And cardiac pacemakers help maintain the regular rhythm and rate of the heart. And they are inserted when the electrical system of the heart is so damaged that it cannot function properly. These battery powered devices deliver an electronic impulse through the wires that are in direct contact with the myocardium. The generating unit typically resembles a silver dollar and is usually placed under a mus uh, heavy muscle or fold of skin in the upper left upper portion of the chest. EMTs normally do not need to be concerned about problems with pacemakers. When they do not function properly, the pacemaker can cause the patients to experience syncope, dizziness, or weakness due to an excessive slow heart rate. So the pulse will ordinarily be less than 60 beats per minute if it's not malfunctioning properly. A patient with a malfunctioning pacemaker should be promptly transported to the emergency department. When an AED is used, the patches should be placed, uh, should not be placed directly over the pacemaker. So an automatic implantable cardiac defibrillator are sometimes used in patients who have survived cardiac arrest due to ventricular fibrillation. These devices continuously monitor the heart rhythm and de will deliver shock as needed. Treat these patients like all other patients having an AMI or acute myocardial infarction, including performing CPR and using the AED if the patient goes into cardiac arrest. The electricity from the automatic implantable cardiac defibrillator is so low that it will have no effect on the rescuers. And then there is an external defibrillator vest. So this vest, um, this device is a vest with built-in monitoring electrodes and defibrillator pads, which is worn by the patient under his or her clothing. The vest is attached to a monitor worn on the belt or hung from a shoulder strap. The device uses a high energy shock similar to an AED, should, uh, so you should avoid contact with the patient if the device warns that it is about to deliver a shock. The vest should remain in place while CPR is being performed unless it interferes with the compressions. If it is necessary to remove the vest, simply remove the battery from the monitor and then remove the vest. Next thing we're going to talk about, um, the next type of assisted device is an LVAD. And so that is a left ventricular assist device. These devices are used to enhance the pumping of the left ventricle in patients with severe heart failure or in patients who need a temporary boost uh, due to um, myocardial infarction. So may be pulsatile or continuous the patient or family may be able to tell you more about the device. Unless the device malfunctions, you should not have to deal with it. So contact medical control if there's any doubt in what to do. Transport the LVAD supplies and battery packs with the patient. 
Okay, so the next cardiovascular emergency we're going to discuss is cardiac arrest. And so when there is no cardiac activity, electrical, mechanical, or both, meaning um, there's no electrical activity in the muscle, there's the muscle is not beating, um, this is known as cardiac arrest. And it is indicated in the field by the absence of a carotid pulse. Cardiac arrest is, uh, is almost always terminal until the advent of CPR and external defibrillators in the 1960s. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about automatic de external defibrillators, and this in involves the use of a small computer, an automatic external defibrillator, an AED, that analyzes electrical signals from the heart. And it identifies ventricular fibrillation and is extremely accurate. It uh, administers a shock to the heart when needed. So AEDs come in different models. All models require the operator some type of operator interaction. So you either have to turn the pads on or turn on the machine. The operator must push a button to deliver the shock. And many use a computer a voice synthesizer to advise the patient, the EMT, which steps to take next. And most of the AEDs are semi-automated. So the advantages of using an AED use I include the following. So an AED use is quick delivery of an electric shock, electrical shock. It's easy to operate. There's no need for an advanced life support provider to be on scene when doing it. Um, it could be remote. Uh, defibrillator pads are safe to use and large pad area with manual paddles so a larger pad area with manual paddles, which means that the transmission of electricity is more effective. Other conditions, uh, considerations when using an AED include the following. So not all patients in cardiac arrest require an electrical shock. All patients in cardiac arrest should be analyzed, though, with an AED. Some do not have shockable rhythms. So a systole, which is a flat line, indicates that no electrical shock remains. And pulseless electrical activity refers to a state of cardiac arrest that, um, despite an organized electrical rhythm, um, the muscle of the heart is not beating. So early defibrillation is an essential intervention for patients experiencing cardiac arrest. Few patients who experience cardiac arrest outside of the hospital survive unless a rapid sequence of events take place. So there are links in this chain of uh, survival, and these links include, so um, there has to be recognition of an early warning sign and immediate activation of EMS. Then immediate CPR with emphasis on high quality chest compressions needs to be performed. And and then rapid defibrillation with an AED, and basic and advanced EMS um, should be uh, should be used, and advanced life support and post cardiac arrest care needs to be used. So this figure on this slide illustrates the five links in the cardiac chain of survival. So once again, early defibrillation. Um, uh, we're going to keep talking about this. So CPR needs to be, CPR helps patients in cardiac arrest by prolonging the period during which defibrillation can be effective. So rapid defibrillation has successfully resuscitated many patients in cardiac arrest due to ventricular fibrillation. So just think about the ventricles. They're just quivering. They need to be shocked. So defibrillation works best if it takes place within two minutes of the onset of the cardiac arrest. So non-traditional first responders are being trained now to use the AEDs. The final step of the chain of survival is uh, um, ALS or advanced life support and post arrest care. And so what happens is they um, continue ventilations at less than 12 breaths a minute to achieve this end title of 35 to 40 um, millimeters of mercury. So end title um, is a device that we use as paramedics. 
And um, so maintain oxygen saturations between 94 to 99%. Assure blood pressure is above 90 millimeters of mercury. Maintain glucose levels if the patient is hypoglycemic. And it usually includes pulmonary or cardiopulmonary and neurologic support at the hospital, as well as other advanced assessment techniques and interventions when indicated. So when integrating the AED and CPR into patient care, keep the following in mind. It's important to work with the AED and CPR in sequence. So do not touch the patient when the AED is analyzing the heart rhythm and delivering the shock. So CPR must stop when the, while the AED is performing its job. So AED maintenance is important. So become familiar with the maintenance procedures required for the brand of AED that your service will use. Read the operator's manual. Three of the most common area errors in using certain AEDs are failure of the machine to shock fine V-fib. And so um, um, Basically, it's not recognizing the ventricular fib because it's fine, very uh, small V-fib. So apply the AED to the patient um, who is moving, squirming, or being transported. And then another common error is turning off the AED before analysis or shock is completed. Operator errors include failing to apply the AED to the patient in cardiac arrest, not pushing the analyze buttons um, when the machine advises you to do so, and pushing the but power button instead of pushing the shock button when the shock is advised. Make sure the power, make sure the battery is properly maintained. Check the equipment, including your AED, daily at the beginning of each shift, and ask the manufacturer for a checklist of items that should be checked off daily, weekly, um, and off uh, less, uh, less often. Report an AED failure that occurs while caring for a patient to the manufacturer and to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Be sure to follow the appropriate EMS procedures for notifying these organizations. Medical Direction should approve the written protocol that you will follow for caring for patients in cardiac arrest. The EMT team and your service services medical director or quality improvement officer should review each incident in which an AED is used. Review should face should focus on speed of defibrillation, the time of the call to the shock, and the shock should be delivered within one minute of the call. So mandatory continuing education with skill competency review is generally required for EMS providers. Okay, when preparing to use the AED, it is the EMT's job to make sure that electricity from the AED injures no one. Do not defibrillate patients in pooled water. Electricity will diffuse through the pooled water. And uh, you can defibrillate a soaking wet patient, but dry the patient's chest first. Do not defibrillate patients who are touching metal and that others are touching. Carefully remove a nitro patch from the patient's chest and wipe the area with a dry towel before defibrillating to prevent ignition of the patch. It is often helpful to shave the hairy patient's chest before the pad placement to increase conductivity. Determine the patient's nature of, um, nature of illness or mechanism of injury. So perform spinal immobilization for patients who are trauma patients during a, the primary assessment and call for advanced life support assistance if, the tiered, if in a tiered system with a patient in cardiac arrest. Use a well-organized team approach. The figure on the slide displays the AED algorithm. If you witness a patient's cardiac arrest, begin CPR, starting with chest compressions, and attach the AED as soon as possible. After the AED protocol is completed, one of the following is likely. So pulse will, is regained, which is ROSC. ROSC stands for return of spontaneous circulation, and then no pulse, and the AED indicates no shock is advised, or no pulse, and the AED indicates shock is advised. 
If the ALS is responding to the scene, stay where you are and continue the sequence of shocks and CPR. If ALS is not responding to the scene and protocols agree, begin transport with one of the following occurring. The patient regains a pulse. Six to nine shocks are delivered or the machine gives three consecutive messages separated by two minutes of CPR that no shock is advised. So if cardiac arrest uh, occurs during transport, um, and if you're traveling to the hospital with an unconscious patient and the patient becomes pulseless, a national registry tells you to stop the vehicle, begin CPR if the AED is not immediately available, call for advanced life support or other available resources based on the circumstances and local protocols, analyze a rhythm, deliver a shock if indicated, and immediately resume CPR. Continue resuscitation according to your local protocol. If you're en route with a conscious patient who is having chest pain and becomes unconscious, check for a pulse, stop the vehicle, begin CPR, analyze the rhythm, deliver the shock, begin compressions, and continue resuscitation according to your local protocol. Always coordinate with advanced life support personnel according to your local protocols. If you have an AED available, do not wait for paramedics to arrive. Notify advanced life support personnel as soon as possible after you recognize a cardiac arrest. Do not delay defibrillation. When paramedics arrive, inform them of your actions to the point and then interact with them according to your local protocols. Okay, and the last thing we're going to talk about is the management of re return of spontaneous circulation. We call return of spontaneous circulation ROSC. So we're going to monitor for the response of respirations. We're going to provide oxygen via BVM with 12 breath, 10 to 12 breaths per minute. We want to maintain oxygen saturation between 95 to 99%. We're assessing the patient's blood pressure, and we're going to see if the patient can follow simple commands. So if advanced life support is not on scene or en route, immediately begin transport to the closest hospital, appropriate hospital, depending on your local protocol. So thank you. This concludes the Cardiovascular Emergency Chapter 16 lecture. The following slides consist of the review questions. I will allow you to complete these on your own.